Ladies and gentlemen, episode 69 of the Bash Mania podcast. I am your host, as always, Justin Bash. Today we have two-time Olympian, two-time NCAA champion, Hodge Trophy winner, Carrie McCoy joins the show. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, be sure to subscribe wherever you listen. Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, Overcast, wherever you listen to podcasts, be sure to subscribe to Bashamania. And if you enjoy this episode, be sure to leave a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It's Bashamania! Let me tell you something, brother. He gave us everything he had in him tonight. What you gonna do when Bashamania runs wild? Oh, it's gonna be a good one. And business just picked up here on the podcast. Oh, yeah. All right, guys. Happy Saturday morning. We have Carrie McCoy. How are you, Carrie? I'm doing well. Doing well. So uh, excited to be on. So before we really dive in, I got to tell you, I was doing some research and I was on your website, which thank God you have a website. I wish everybody who came on the show had a website. Now it's just like Instagram and Facebook. But I was actually using a tool called archive.org to view your website way back when. It's a super cool tool. It doesn't always work. But I stumbled on your Olympic journal from 2004. And that was one of the coolest things I, I read. I love that you not only like had a website in the early 2000s, but you kept an Olympic journal. Like, And you graduated from Penn State with a degree in marketing, correct? So like, that was you yeah. liked that stuff. Yeah, yeah. It was always uh, – I mean, I'm a, I'm a people person. I'm a relationship guy. So when I went through my journey of uh, you know, making it to the games and all the, uh, the people that helped me get there, I said it, you know, it was fun, but it was also one of those things that I felt like it was um, almost not an obligation in a, in a, in a negative way, but it was, a, it was an opportunity to really share for, for all the people that helped me get there to share my journey with them. So that was what it was all about. And it's funny, yeah, because I actually, because I you know, want to update my site and get it a little bit more modern. And I was going through that a couple of weeks ago and just looking through those. I was like, man, you know, <laughs> I can't believe I, I – and it was, it was so – it was so – to me, it was just like I got up, I ate, I worked out, good workout, good night. And, uh, yeah. But the one one thing I thought about, it was like, you know, I was when I was looking at updating my site, I'm like, oh, yeah, I got to go. And there were some, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, 29, 30 years old, not really, uh, you know, really focus on making sure everything was grammatically correct and, and <laughs> yeah. proper, you know. So I go back and I read. I was like, oh, my goodness, how, you know, and, and I, I knew better, but just it was just kind of getting those raw feelings out and. You know, this is back when you have to, it was HTML site where you, yep. you have to type it and upload. And then if you have to go back, you have to, uh, you know, edit it and then re-upload and replace the file. So I think back then I was just like, hey, let me just get it done. And especially some of those late night ones after training, I was like, oh, I got to do the journal. So it's funny to look back and read and just, you know, I could just bring myself back to that, that time of where I was doing it. And it's so kind of getting something out there. It was so cool too to like see the names because you're right. A lot of it was like I ate, I trained, ten minutes of drill, did twenty minutes of situation alive, whatever it was. But it was cool. Like uh, we went to Best Buy to uh, come back and fix (laughs) Steven's computer or little things like that. But yeah, it's it's super cool, man. So diving into your wrestling story, tell me about how you got started in wrestling. Yeah, that's always a good story, and I've told this story a bunch of times. And it's funny. I mean, I'll uh, I'll give the condensed version i don't know if you're gonna go through everything but it was basically um you know when i started wrestling i started wrestling in seventh grade 12 years old and the reason being it was the first um you know i was was a normal kid you know just go to school come home but i um i wanted to play basketball i thought you know that was going to be my my future i had uh, a hoop in my front yard we used to play before school after school you know on the weekends go to the park so i was all about basketball and seventh grade was the first year of my school district that we could play organized, you know, scholastic sure. sports activities. And the only two sports that were offered were wrestling and track. So basketball didn't start until eighth grade. So I wanted to do something. I didn't, you know, I didn't want to just keep just the normal routine of go to school, come home, play. So I, I was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play this sports. And a buddy of mine who had known, you know, from elementary school was in the kid wrestling program and he had wrestled. So he's like, hey, yeah, you know, you know, you should try wrestling. And I was like, well, yeah, okay. I, you know, I watch it 
every weekend on TV. I, I like Hulk Hogan. I like Andre the Giant, you know? So that's what, uh, that's what it was. And, um, so you thought it was going to be Monday there. night raw, basically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Basically. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it was, it was funny because that's what I thought it was. And, you know, the whole week before our first practice, I, um, you know, I was thinking about what, you know, what my nickname is going to be, you know, trying to come up with a finishing move. And, you know, I joke, I'm like, uh, was going to wear a mask or not a mask. I was going to wear the long tights, the, you know, the, the, the short briefs. And so that's what I was thinking about. And then um, I show up and, and practice the first day. And obviously, we know what a wrestling room looks like. Yep. And, uh, you know, I see these mats on the floor and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, you know, maybe gymnastics practice is, uh, is finishing up. They roll up these mats and, <laughs> build the ring and we're going to do all this stuff. So, um, so yeah, that was, that was kind of my first introduction and, you know, coach walks in the first day and he's like, you know, we get going, he's like, start running. So, you know, I'm, I'm super confused. First I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, ring, ring ropes and turnbuckles. And then I'm thinking, all right, well, yeah, gymnastic tumbling and all. And then I'm like, well, track season doesn't start until the spring. What are we, what are we doing here? But, um, right through there and we were practicing our middle school and you know, running through the halls in middle school. And I tell people, I don't know, maybe it's something about freedom of being able to run in school where you never get to do that before. Right. But that, that first day I fell in love with it. And it was just like, I had no idea what I was getting into. I had no idea what it was about, but I just said, you know, this is something I'm going to do. So just the energy that was in yeah. that room, you know, with those group of guys together was something that, that latched on my heart right away. And, um, and I wasn't good at all. You know, I, I tell people I was, I was the worst wrestler to ever start wrestling in the history of wrestling. I, was so <laughs> I doubt that because and, uh, I was definitely worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, I mean, I, I had no idea, no idea what I was doing. And, um, but I just, I loved it. I was, I was, I just wanted to get better. And, and that was, that was the, when I started, right? I didn't have a, I didn't set out to be a, a national champ or a state champ or, you know, heck even a, a starter. I just started, I just wanted to learn this thing because it, it grabbed me. And I just said, I want to learn. I want to be the best that I can be not knowing what that would be and not knowing what that would entail. But I just came every day with that idea of learning and learning and learning. And, um, and slowly but surely I, I had more success, but my, my first year of wrestling in seventh grade, so we're wrestling junior high and I didn't have one competitive match, um, in, in the, in the regular season. And it's like, it's junior high, right? You know, even to this day, I mean, you, you know, you think about junior high sports and everybody gets to participate. Everybody gets to, to get a, know get a shot and right i didn't have one match and i remember one time um and it wasn't i mean one like i said i wasn't very good but it's just like the uh the opportunities i mean i was on the bottom of the depth chart so um i remember with the one time that i talked about i had a chance the guys that were ahead of me were were sick or hurt or something but i was going to get a shot to wrestle and you know we had a dual meet and i was all fired up had my weight under control and showed up before the match and I was got on a scale and I made weight and then I got off and then to hear the other coach say, Oh, we don't have anybody there. So they were, <laughs> you know, this is junior high. So I was like, all right, we're going to, you know, it's just going to be a, a no, no match at that weight class. So I was like, Oh goodness. You know? <laughs> so it was like the one time that I had a chance, but, but then I, you know, in the off season, I wrestled, I wrestled year round from start you know, when I started and um, the off season, we had our, our freestyle County tournament and there was uh there was one kid in my weight class. You know, so this is, so I had one match, and uh, and then that qualified us for the state tournament. And then I went to the state tournament, and there were uh, three guys in, in the Greco-Roman weight class, and there was four guys in or yeah four guys in freestyle. And I, I finished third in Greco, and I finished fourth in freestyle. Wow! <laughs> so that was uh, you know I, I was I was Owen Owen two in, in Greco, and I think I was Owen three in freestyle. But <laughs> but I, I I got to compete. Yeah. And, um, but it was just like, you know, that just, that's, that's how that first year ended. And I got better. I improved, you know, I, I was learning more and but my, uh, my appetite to, to, to really take the sport to the next level had been lit that first day. And I just kept building on it for there. And then slowly but surely I got better in eighth grade. I was, uh, still junior high school. I think I was like seven and one in ninth grade. I was undefeated on the junior high team. And then you know, just kept rolling from there. At what point did you realize you could have a career like you end up having? Um, I don't know. I, I think it was just kind of organically happened over time. I mean, yeah. I wrote in junior high school, seventh, eighth, ninth grade, where you know a lot of people when they get into reaching higher levels of the sport, you know, they jump in there in the varsity room, eighth, ninth grade, and yeah. you know, 
getting there, competing, qualifying for state tournaments and like that. And my first year in high school uh, on the varsity, the 10th grade, I lost in the first round of a league tournament. So the way it goes in New York, you go leagues, counties, and then you have to, back then, you place top four in your league, then you go to the counties, and you have to win the county to go to the state. Well, I lost first round on a league tournament, so I didn't even have a chance to qualify for a <laughs> qualifier. And, um, you know, that, that summer, I, um, you know, like I said, I wrestled year round. And that summer, that, that losing first round in a league tournament, and our high school hosted the county tournament, which is a state qualifier. And I remember sitting in the stands, and uh, I mean, our, our high school gym's not huge, you know, probably 2,500 people capacity. But I remember seeing it, sitting up in the, in the rafters, it felt like, like you know, 10,000 feet away from the, the competition mat and watching the county tournament and me not being in there. And, uh, and I just felt this, this just terrible feeling in my gut. It's like, I do not like the way this feels and I'm going to do everything I can to make sure I don't feel this way again. And that was kind of a, you know, a, a, a turning point. And, and like I said, I was making progress seventh, eighth, ninth grade, but it was, uh, was that sitting there and watching the County tournament and not participating was, uh, and, and I guess fortunately or unfortunately, I've, I've had that feeling a bunch of times throughout my career. Yeah. But I remember that was a, was a really defining moment. And, Later that year, um, I went out to the Cadet Nationals, and I ended up finishing second at the Cadet Nationals. And the guy that beat me, a guy named Pat Schuster from Pennsylvania, he beat me, and um, he uh, decided he didn't want to go to the World Championships for whatever reason. So I got an opportunity to go to the Cadet World Championships, and I had a training camp, and Bruce Burnett, who was a national team coach, he was a long-time coach at Naval Academy, he was uh, the coach for the Cadet team. He ended up being my coach on the cadet team, on the junior world team, and then on the Olympic team. So I had a, a great relationship. I mean, to this day, I have a great relationship. But, you know, that was where it kind of started that summer, getting out to Colorado Springs and training with some of the best kids in the country, and then going overseas. It was in Hungary for the world championships, and I ended up making the finals, and I lost in the finals. So I was a cadet world silver medalist, um, you know, three years after I started wrestling. And I think that was really a big, just that whole process from – sure seeing seeing you know the county tournament and then making that that commitment to, to not want to feel that way again and then getting out to, to make that world team and continue to grow and compete and um you know it, it's uh it's pretty awesome because during that trip i mean the guys on the trip were unbelievable but brandon slay and lincoln McElroy were two of the guys on that trip and um we made the cadet world team together we made the junior world team together and then we made the olympic team together so that just shows the caliber of the people that were involved in those on those those teams with that first team getting ready for the cadets was uh, was unbelievable. So I think that that was a real turning point for me and sure. getting exposed to elite level competition in the U.S. Those guys that were from all over the country and then and then at the World Championships and you know then it was kind of keep on grinding from there. And, yeah. Um, you know, eleventh grade I came back and I was uh, you know, I won the counties and took second state and then my senior year I came back with a state champ. So I started wrestling in seventh grade and. Five years later, I was, uh, you know, cadet world silver medalist, a time state finalist, state champ, and um, you know, and that that kind of laid the foundation for uh, for bigger things to come. But it was, yeah. So I think I, you know, going back, I think it was that defining moment of sitting in the in the stands watching the county tournament and just feeling, you know, just horrible in the pit of my stomach that uh, that I didn't want to feel that way again. Totally. And I've had those experiences of living out of my car and not knowing where my next meal is coming from. And when you experience those types of things, that is such a driver to not want to be back in that place or to help you in your initial pursuit of getting out of that place. Right. And I'm curious, like, what led you to Penn State after that? So, um, yeah, it's another good story because, uh, and I, I mean, I, I can laugh about it. I'm a little bit embarrassed, but you know, <laughs> it is what it is. But coming out, um, they were not from my high school. We had a few people that that kind of went quote unquote big time. You know, a lot of our kids that graduated from my school, they they stayed local, and uh, a lot of the athletes, if they if they competed, they went to state schools for the most part. And we had a few people that went, but it wasn't that that highly uh, publicized, and especially like it is today. So. Um, I had no concept of Penn State. Um, I really had no concept of, of sure. you know, Division Division One athletics or whatever. I just I looked at athletics and coming up, it was um, you know, in New York they had the, 
the state system. So the state universities in New York, SUNY, yep. you know, Brockport and things like that, that had wrestling. And so that's what I thought when I thought of state schools, I thought of, you know, Brockport and, you know, those type of schools that, uh, that I knew on the Island. So when I heard of, and you know, Penn, state university of Pennsylvania, I thought it was the same thing as state university of New York, like small you know, <laughs> division three type programs. And, you know, and sure. I was like, so as it started coming through, you know, I really, really had no clue. And, and, and the, the ironic thing of, of how Penn State you know, really got turned on to me was I had a, a guy that went to my rival high school. His name was Jason Kraft. And the rival high school was Sachem. And Sachem had some people that, you know, went big-time athletics a lot. And uh, There was a guy, Dan Mayo, who went to Penn State. So that was yep. kind of Jason Kraft's, one of his, his big inspirational guys. And so Dan kind of had Jason on the, the Penn State no track and then uh Penn State was recruiting Jason and Jason's like, Hey, you know, I uh I competed with this guy down the road and you know, we we've won some some of the national teams, you know, Cadet National Team, Junior National Team, so we had known each other and we we're good friends, but we competed against each other as rival teams and he he was kinda like, Hey, you know, it'd be great, you know, we've competed against each other for so much, it'd be great if we could be teammates and yeah. he was kinda bent on on going to Penn State. So he's like, Hey, I, you know, you guys should should check out this Kerry McCoy guy. So that's kinda how he, uh, how they got, got aware of me, you know, they came to watch him wrestle in our, in our rival duel and they saw me and then that, that's kind of how it picked up. So it's ironic how that, that, that thing worked out. And he ended up going to Nebraska and I ended up going to Penn State, but really the, um, the, 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 the draw to Penn State, like I said, when it came down to it, I, I, I had no clue. And I remember I, I had a job at a, at a sports store and, um, I was sitting there on one of my afternoon shifts and on a Saturday and, I was listening to the radio and, um, and I hear, hear the, you know, the sports announcements and they're saying, Oh yeah, you know, Penn State beat Cincinnati 81 to nothing. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, this, this again, this can't be a big, you know, big time school, like, you know, high level competition, you know, you don't, you don't see a team beating so much by 80 points. And, you know, so I just really had no concept of what, of what Penn State was. And, uh, I was looking at, academic schools. I was looking at the Ivy league schools initially because, um, you know, I, I had a decent academic foundation and, and then I was looking at some of the non Ivy league schools. And when it came out, I, you know, I had eight schools on my list when I finally pared it down and four were, were Ivy league schools and four non Ivy. And, and Penn state was actually the, the last school on my list, you know, when I started compiling just because, you know, I had that connection to, to Jason Kraft and I had a couple other people that, you know, said that Penn state was a good, a good opportunity, but no one really, and no one in my circle really knew really what Penn state was bringing to the table as a, as one of the best institutions in the, in the country, in the world. So, um, so I just kind of was like, yeah, you know, be fun. And yeah, okay, coach, you know, it's good to hear you. Good talking. You know, so as I, as I went through the process, um, it, it was got narrowed down to my last two choices were Michigan and, and Penn state. And, um, I actually, I had a visit scheduled to Cornell, and that was going to be my last visit. And um, I visited Penn State, Michigan. Ryan, and um, Ryan, after, uh, sorry about that. Of course. Um, after, uh, after my, uh, my visit to Penn State, I visited Michigan and Penn State in the same weekend. And I, I had to call the Cornell coach and say, hey, you know, this is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to, to kind of figure it out. So I don't know if I'm going to take that visit. To Cornell because you know I feel pretty pretty confident that you know I've got some good options here at Michigan and Penn State and if I if I go to Cornell you know I hear it's so beautiful out there that I may fall in love with it and I don't really want to <laughs> complicate my my decision anymore so I think uh, you know, I'm just going to focus on these two and um, and when I went on my when I went on my Michigan visit it was it was uh, it was all unbelievable like I had so I'm a year younger than the Fat Five so. You know, Jalen Rose and, and, and those guys were uh, Chris Weber, and they were all uh, freshmen. So this was when they went to the, to the Final Four. And I remember on my, on my recruiting visit to Michigan was the, uh, the weekend of the Final Four. So, you know, they were playing, and so Ann Arbor was rocking. You know, everybody was excited about, you know, we got these sure. five freshmen that are making it to the national championship. And I actually, you know, I told uh, the, the Michigan, fan, you know, Michigan coach, I was like, hey, you know, I love it here. This is where I want to be. And I – had always had a, a little bit of a connection to Michigan back, you know, when, when they won a national championship in basketball in the late eighties. And, you know, I, I followed it 
And then I just I loved the uh, the Wolverine uniforms the football team had, and just like I just had a connection to Michigan like that. So I um, I thought I was going to go to Michigan, but I visited Michigan uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and um, my Penn State visit was Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. So I was literally going from Ann Arbor to City College. So I was like, well, you know, I really want to come here, but I'm you know I've got my visit set to to Penn State, so. You know, if, if nothing crazy happens at Penn State, I think I'm going to end up at Michigan. And it was it was interesting because nothing crazy happened. But when I went on my visit to, to Penn State, it was uh, you know it was Sunday night. We uh, we went to a movie and a couple of guys, and then Monday night we actually watched the uh, the the championship game, Michigan playing in the championship game. And I was telling you know I was like yeah you know I, just, I had a great visit last you know last couple of days, and I you know I'll be going to school with those guys next year. And and the the guys at Penn State you know. <laughs> John and Russ Hughes and a couple other guys were like, yeah, yeah, whatever, you know, and it just like <laughs> didn't even pay any attention. And what I, what I realized was when I was at all the other places I went to, I was on a recruiting visit, right. I was, you know, just on a visit and, and it, it wasn't, I don't know if it was intentional things, but it's just the way I felt, right. I'm here and I'm trying to be recruited to, to come to school. But when I was on my visit to Penn state, I just felt like I was, I was where I belonged. You know, I felt like I was home. Like, no, there yeah. was no, Hey, you're gonna do this. You're gonna do that. It was just like, hey, we're hanging out. It was like I felt like I was hanging out with my with my family, right. I was hanging out with my people that I'd known for. And I and I had no clue um, who they were, and you know, before the visit. But it was just it was just a, a natural fit. And then ultimately, when I um when I sat down and figured out, you know, kind of had to to choose between the two. Um, what really thinks that Penn State apart was its commitment to international wrestling. You know, I, 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 by that time. My senior year, you know, I had made that commitment that I wanted to make an, make an Olympic team and I wanted to be successful in the international styles. And Penn State had a had a huge commitment. It went to the Northeast Regionals. And some of the other schools that I was looking at, they'd have two or three guys competing. And you know, Penn State had like 15 guys at the tournament. And um, so I just knew that Penn State had a, a commitment to international wrestling. And I felt like, you know, at this point, I was going to get a great degree no matter where I looked at. I was, I was going to get a great education. Um, you know, I had teams that were competitive and you know in a position to compete at a high level, and uh, the the connection to the international wrestling was really the the uh, the icing on the cake. But I really think that you know the combination of all those together and just the feel that I got when I was on campus made uh, made the decision pretty easy. So that's, uh, totally. And what do you think led to your success at Penn State specifically? Like you had so much success. What do you think contributed most to that? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, um, you know, probably oh, 10, 15 years ago, as I was going through and I would tell people, I kind of taught the same thing that, you know, I made a, I made a commitment and, you know, when I was in seventh grade to, to work hard and get better every day and, you know, feeling those different, um, drivers to be successful. And, you know, that's, uh, that's definitely a big part of it, but, you know, now, especially, in the last few years and I've been able to get a little bit mature and kind of focus in, I think that number one, I, I would go back to my faith and you know, I'm, I'm very blessed that God put me in a position. He you know, gave me some, some natural talents and, but he put me in a position throughout my life where I was going to be around people that would help me to, to reach my full potential. And, and that's, that's, uh, that's something that's really important to me because, you know, I don't believe in coincidences. Yep. coincidences. I think that, you know, God has a plan for us all. And, and you, you go back and you look and just like the, the different opportunities that I've had and the different things that have shown up, it was just like, you know, perfect timing in so many situations. So I, so I, I credit, you know, his, his presence in my life and, and, and it comes to the people. So, you know, when I was a freshman in college, I was, uh, I was 19 and 17. And, uh, that was, uh, more matches that I lost in, in one season that I had in my three years wrestling varsity and, and, uh, comparatively, you know, between eighth and junior high as well. So almost all, you know, in, in the five years pr- previous to, uh, to college, I lost the, uh, the equivalent of number of matches in one year. So, you know, it was, uh, it was a rough freshman year, but during that process, I always had encouragement. Um, my coaches, my teammates, workout partners, you know, the fans, and, you know, I, I tell people all the time, especially after my freshman year, I'm sure there were some people like, what the heck, why do we bring this guy in when he, you know, <laughs> sure. every other match I was getting beaten. But um, 
anytime I, I interacted in a, in, a, in a social setting, in a public setting, you know, it was it was always support. You know, the, uh, the alumni, the fans, boosters, they were all just like, hey, yeah, you know, and it just it was just one of those things like, you know, we love you, we love you for who you are and what you bring to the table, and it wasn't just about how I was performing on the mat. Now, if some of them saw, I know Coach Lorenzo re- was recruiting me, and Coach Fritz was the uh, was my coach, so. You know, they saw something in me, and maybe those are the things that the fans and the people that that follow the sport really uh, understand. So, I think that was a uh, that was a big thing that just the people that God put in my life around that process made a big difference on me. Totally, and I know everybody's different, and everybody's faith plays different roles in their career. For you, when did you notice it was such an important part of your career? It's always been something that uh, so we we got into. I got into church when I was like nine years old, um, and I, I had no idea what it was. It was my um, my mom, my sister, I had a younger sister, and my mom worked full time. And when I was in school, my mom was my sister a babysitter, and, and my brother, who was my sister, five years younger than me, my brother, seven years younger than me. And so when I was in school, my mom would you know, drop them off the babysitter, and I'd be in school. So the babysitter was very, very strong, and very involved in their church, and you know, through the process. And I don't know how many times it, it was um, brought up, but eventually my mom agreed to go to church and bring us, bring us to church. And so that was around nine years old when we started going. And, um, you know, within the first year, you know, my mom accepted Christ and she, she was, was a model, you know, for, for how we should be, be living. And so it was just like, that's what we did. We went to church and we grew up Baptist. So, we, you know, we were in the church three, four days a week and, yeah. you know, five, six hours on the weekend on Sundays. So, you know, we were just immersed in it. And I didn't really know what that meant, but I know that, you know, I love Jesus. And, you know, we learned in that if you, if you, if you accept him and, you know, you're going to, you're going to be taken care of, you're going to be all right. You know, you're going to have everlasting life. And, um, so I, you know, I accepted Christ at nine, 10 years old, but not really understanding what it meant. And, but that was a foundation that, you know, for those, years of high school growing up that it just kept getting bigger and bigger and more solid of, you know, I believe and I trusted and, and I always was, was prayerful and going through you know, high school and getting out of high school where you're going every day, you have that routine and going to college and post-college kind of a little bit out of the routine, but my foundation of faith and believing and praying was something that I never really got away from. Sure. And then, you know, when you start with your own family and when you know, got married and started having kids and start really, focusing in and having that that higher purpose you know that's when i started to really re uh reignite and re-engage and um and i tell a story when we were out at stanford the first time um tanner gardner was on the team and he was very open about his faith and and very intentional and that was also a big a big uh reignition for me to uh you know to reignite my faith and my practice and my intentionality so Um, you know, so that's how it, it, it really came back in. And then, you know, in my, to involve that, my, my, you know, my competitive career as always prayer and, and, and then my personal professional career as a coach, you know, trying to seek out people that I could learn and grow from. But like I said, in the last six, seven years is when it really, really started to to build with the people that God put in my life. And we have a guy named Daryl Colbert, who was, uh, who was brought on as a, our FCA liaison team chaplain a few years ago when uh when i was at maryland and he was just such a blessing to me to be able to pour into and and then other people in our neighborhood other people in the community other people on campus so just continue to grow and then you know back in probably 2012 2013 you when i saw a resurgence of faith uh with a lot of athletes um you know wrestlers in general but specifically you know just athletes were being more intentional about sharing their faith so you go back to, to Tim Tebow and and how he was bold about his faith, and so just over 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 time, it just continued to get you know more yep. and more momentum and more and more more awareness, and so it's just like it was just awesome. And because I had the foundation of belief, um, you know, it, it was it was easier to to just continue to grow and build where I didn't have to I didn't have to seek out you know at, at 25 30 years old try to seek out and, and figure all this stuff out and find out what foundation was I had that foundation but you know I just had to to recommit myself and and uh, be more intentional about it and then be able to share and and you know get it get get it out being that way so that's kind of how the cycle went for me and I think that 
you know, the more intentional you are, the more intentional it, it allows other people to be. And there's a lot of examples and a lot of, uh, of opportunities to share on, on a high level. Sure. And when you look at your college career, you know, you won 131 out of your last 132 matches in college and you had an 88 match winning streak. No, a lot of people would feel a lot of pressure there. And I'm curious of how your faith played into kind of managing those expectations of not not having your identity tied to wins or losses and not getting too caught up in a win streak or not losing a lot of matches. Yeah. What was that like trying to manage that expectation when you were so good? Yeah, you know, and it's interesting, you know, I talked about that that kind of watershed moment when I was a sophomore in high school watching the county county tournament and um that that came back after my freshman year and at the NCAA tournament, you know, again like I said, it's it's happened a few times in my career. So at the NCAA tournament I was one and two and the guy that, that knocked me out of the tournament was the guy that had beaten her in a regular season, a guy named Jeff Coyver from Pitt. And, um, and I remember sitting in my, my hotel room and again, going back to that seventh grade year where I was like, I just, I hate the way this feels. I don't ever want to feel this way again. And, um, you know, kind of back in seventh grade, it was, okay, let's continue to work and put the, put the effort in and commit it. And, and, you know, I always had that, but after it happened in, in college, I was like, okay, you know, I'm working hard. I'm trying to be the best that I can. And, and I just said, you know, what do I need to, what do I need to do? And, and this is, you know, looking back now, I, it's easy to say at the time, I don't think I acknowledged it as, as, as much as I should have, but it was like, you know, it just came and I said, I'm going to, I'm going to make a commitment that uh, I'm never going to lose another college match. So again, typically, you know, you, you try to keep it on the, the positive. Like I want to just win and I want to, or I want to do my best and go out perform at a high level and the wins and losses will take care of itself. But, you know, that was something that was, it was, just clear as day. Like, I don't like the way this feels and I, and I never want to lose another college match. And that's, um, you know, that's something that it was, it was, it was not a, Hey, I'm just going to say this to myself and, you know, just kind of keep it tucked away. But it was like, that was what I told everyone when they said, what, you know, what, what do you think? I'm never going to lose again. And, you know, typically, like you said, you want to do more positive saying, okay, I'm just going to go out and do my best and all. But I, sure. I, I got to that point where, um, I, I hated losing, you know, more than I, than I enjoyed winning. And, um, you know, and not, I, you know, I don't think it was, it was really fundamental on that, but that's kind of where my, you know, when I think back, that's where my feeling was like, I'm going to do everything I can because I don't want to feel the feeling of, of, uh, of loss again. But then the most important thing was I'm going to do everything I can. But I'm going to put the work in. So that's where I say God was working because, you know, he was able to put the people around me. You know, again, he put that work ethic in me. He gave me the talent, gave me the ability to put the people around me to be able to you know, lean on and, and, and seek out. So, you know, after that turn, I took a little bit of time off, and um, I was cutting a lot of weight my freshman year. So, you know, I, I let my body, let nature take its course. So, wasn't uh, I wasn't uh, you know draining my body so much, but I competed um, like two weeks. Two weeks after the tournament, I, you know, I was, I was competing again. I think that summer I, I competed in seven competitions, and uh, you know, I think I won five of them. I was made a cadet. I mean, met the SBAR, which is the uh, now Sealer Junior W UWW Junior. Yep. Um, I made that world team in Greco. Um, I uh, I took second in freestyle, and um, I won the University Nationals, which got me on the Pan Am team. So I got two training camps out in Colorado Springs. Again, got exposed to, you know, those elite level guys and, you know, helped me to get to that point. And it was just like, I, I, you know, again, I had some opportunities to present themselves because of the, the commitment and the competition that I had. And then, uh, and that's just where it went. So that's how that, the run went from there. And, you know, so again, in my, myself, it was like, I'm not going to lose anymore. I told people I'm not going to lose anymore. But when I went out to compete, it was just like focus on and on going out there. So I guess like, I didn't have that when I stepped in the mat, like I'm going here not to lose. I'm going out there to, to compete to my, best of ability and you know see how well i can do but my preparation was focused on hey i need to do everything i can to make sure i don't lose when i step out there in the weekend so when i was on the mat it wasn't so much like hey you know i don't want to lose it was go out there and and, and dominate but you know my preparation my daily routines were set up that say hey you know i know that and it's a situation you talk about all the time right once you make a, a commitment your your choices your daily choices change so you know when you commit it to doing the things you need to do to make sure you never lose another match. Well, there's the likelihood of you cutting a corner, the likelihood of you slacking off, the likelihood of you, you know, not paying attention to your coaches 
is is a lot lower if you if you make those kind of choices. So, so I think that's that. You know, looking back now, I say it was definitely God's hand moving me and working um, to 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 give me those thoughts and give me that commitment and have the people around me to uh, to enable me to to reach ahead. So, um, yeah, and then it was it was you know after the first year. Um, and I remember I, I, I tell people, so at Penn State back then, um, and they, they have it now, but they, you know, it was, the room wasn't, wasn't, uh, what it is now. So it's was, it was a little bit smaller and, you know, and they had the, the picture of the national champions hanging on the wall. And I remember my freshman year, you know, I'd run around, like I want my picture on the wall and my sophomore year, you know, I want to get my picture on the wall. So after I won my sophomore year, I had my picture on the wall and then through my junior year. And I don't think that I. I, I actually, I think my junior, year I was, I was wrestling. That was some of the best wrestling that I did my junior year. I think that you know, I had, I had a lot of good things going on. Um, you know, a tough call in the NCAA tournament, my junior year in the semifinals and, you know, end up not going my way. And, and I remember after that year, um, you know, I came back and, and I took my picture off the wall in the wrestling room. And I said, you know, again, I don't, I don't know how much of a, of an influence it, it had, but I know that, you know, for two years, I looked at that wall every day and my goals, my focus was I get my picture on the wall. And so now that my picture is on the wall, you know, did that take away from my, from my drive? Did that take away from my dedication? I don't think so. But it was just one of those things that, yeah, that's you know, interesting. So I, I took my picture off the wall and, um, you know, then the next year in, in, in 96, I, I ended up redshirting, um, and, uh, you know, so I didn't compete for the for the college team, and then came back, and so now my picture is off the wall again for for a year and a half. And um, so then I got back to that. You know, again, I, it's those little things that you know did it really make a big difference? We never know. But I was like, I still got that point when I'm running around every day after my uh, junior year, like I want my picture on the wall. And um, so that that was another one of those things that like those little things that just had those those motivational things to uh to get going then you know at the end of the year i i won and i got my picture back on the wall so that's pretty cool it's interesting and when you do have you know it's interesting when you talk about repetitive success and somebody who wins something and then trying to win it again and when you have won so many big matches and you have so many accolades you know winning the dan hodge trophy and beating guys like mako and steven neal and you've you've been at the top of the top and you've had losses where you fall short whether it's a win streak being snapped or whether it's you know a silver medal at the world championships or not winning an olympic medal there, there's highs and lows how did you balance those highs and lows of your career yeah that's uh you know again having the 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 insight and perspective now i mean it was, it was definitely god's presence and the people that he put in my mom is my mom is she's she's so awesome and it was uh I mean, I mean, to the point sometimes when I would talk to her, I'd get frustrated because she was just so non, um, like it didn't matter if, if I won or if I lost or, you know, if it was a nine match one streak or if it was you know, the first time you stepped on it, she just, she was the same with me. And, and that was just one of the, the most, you know, uh, grounding, most, most, most you know, meaningful. I mean, there's so many different words, but it's like, she was always there. And I remember when I lost in 95 and I don't even to this day, I don't, I don't know how, but she somehow got her way down to the, to the, it was in Carver Hawk. I remember she got her way down to the, to the ground floor. She couldn't get on the arena floor, but she got to the ground floor. And, and I remember when I lost that match, I mean, as clear as day, I lost and, and I, um, I, 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 I took a second you know I was put my at the match and I rolled over and I was on my my hands and knees and and I was just saying it's like it's you know it's it's over you know you know I lost and, and I was thinking you know like I set this goal to never lose another match and I, and yeah. I just lost the match you know so I was like oh man you know I and but the Carver Hawk Arena 16,000 people and I lost to a guy from Northern Iowa so you know an Iowa boy and I was I was you know 10 matches short of Dan Gable's record um, so, you know, in Iowa, so I'm sure there were so many people that were, were happy that an Iowa sure. guy won, you know, that Dan gave his record was going to be secure, but the entire arena was dead silent. Like I could not hear a, a, a single sound from the time that, you know, the wet referee blew the whistle, you know, I just had in my head, it's over. I remember just saying it's over. I got up, I shook his hand. My coaches were there, you know, they hugged me. We walked out of the arena silence. And then my mom was there in the hallway. And that's when I was, and again, I still, I don't know how she did it. I mean, it's, 
it, but she was there and, um, she met me in the hallway and she, she hugged me and, you know, and then, and then I started to hear sounds again and, and I started to, you know, just kind of take it in. It was just like, you know, all right, well, I got to come back and get third. And, um, so, so that's the, you know, she was such a strong source of support for me throughout everything. She was at every major, um, event and, um, but not in a way like crazy, you know, over, over anxious, over excited. She was just there. And, you know, and I think maybe like, <laughs> me out there you know she might it might have been different sitting next to her in the stands but every time we interacted around competition she was the same just low-key and calm and and very supportive so i think that made a big difference um and then you know like i said the the other people that that were in my life i mean i my coaches my workout partners my, my family i mean everybody was just so supportive of me and win lose a draw and that that made a big deal and i you know i, I credit it to to God's presence in, in my life and, and most of the people that I was connected to, he was you know, very, uh, very big part of their lives as well. So, you know, just like that overall. And, and I didn't have that necessary perspective while I was going through it because it's just yeah. kind of like you go and you're not really thinking, but looking back on it, it, it couldn't be anything but, but his presence. And, and that's why I, you know, really, really thankful for that. But um, I always talk about just the people, you know, and everything and anything is the people you surround yourself with. And, you know, sometimes you don't actively choose those people, but, you know, they're there. And um, so that's what I credit to the, the ups and downs, the, the, the highs and lows were, you know, I always had people around me and and uh, that helped to, to just keep me on focus that, hey, tomorrow's another day. And, you know, and, and that's, that's important to, to focus on. For sure. And, you know, I want to talk a little bit about your coaching career, too. You know, when you were done competing, what was the transition like for you from athlete to coach? So it was pretty, pretty awesome. Again, you know, talking about the people and you know, I, I finished from, from college and I stayed on as assistant coach at Penn State. And then I was there for three years. And then, um, you know, so working alongside John Fritz, who was my coach, and then Troy Sunderland was the head coach. So he was my teammate and he was a coach of mine. So having those relationships. And then when I went to Lehigh, Greg Strobel was our national team coach. He or was a national team coach. He was New York AC coach. He was my coach in the corner of the Olympic Games, and uh, and you know through my pro. So having those those coaching coaching mentors that were in my life really helped the transition be pretty smooth because I had some of the best teachers. And um, so when I was done competing completely, um, you know I was coaching at Lehigh, and I, and I talked to Greg, and he knew that I had wanted to go into coaching and. And the, really the transition from, from, you know, athlete to coach and knowing that I wanted to coach was um, just the impact that so many people had had on me, uh, my mentors, my, my um, you know, people that made a difference in my life. And I just wanted to be able to give back to the sport and give back to people the way that I had people pour into me. So that was the transition because initially I thought I'm going to graduate and, you know, wrestle for a couple of years and then I'm going to go back to, school, get my MBA and be working on wall street or somewhere in the private sector. You know, coaching wasn't one of these things that I looked into for a long time, but as the years went through my competitive career, being able to pour into people in camps and clinics throughout the years, I was like, yeah, you know, I, I've had some impact and I want to be able to give back and I think I'll be pretty good. So that, that last year of my, my time at Lehigh, it was an intentional thing where I, you know, I talked to Greg and I said, Hey, you know, I, I want to be a head coach. And, you know, he mentored me, you know, put me on his wing and said, you know, we'd get together, we'd talk about stuff. And as the assistant coach, I was a volunteer. I was in on recruiting meetings and I was engaged in different things, hanging out with, you know, Pat Centoro was an assistant there and Chris Ayers and Scott Hovind. And those are the guys that were around. So I would try to learn for as much as I could. And that's something that I just had throughout my, my competitive career, just be around the best people you can be and learn. And that's what I did with my coaching career. So that year from 04 to 05, um, you know, just having having Greg as a mentor and having the other coaches around Lehigh's mentors, but also the foundation of all the other coaches that I had to that point, really made it, it, it a, an easy transition. Um, I think the toughest thing from going from athlete to coach is you know giving up that that quote unquote control, right? So as an athlete, you get to go out there and do it. As a coach, you know you have to train them up and prepare them the best you can, and then you know let them on their way. So that was probably the toughest transition for me is that. You know, I know you have it in you. I know you put the work and you put the time in. Now go out there and perform. But then I guess I can watch you, and you know, I can't. I can't do anything about it one way or the other. So, um, you know, and those are those are things, especially as people, but really as wrestlers, that we have. And we most of us have some kind of control issues. So 
Um, totally. It, it was, uh, it was you know, getting that rid of, but it, it was, it was good transition because of the people that I had around me to prepare me. And what do you think, like, you've had so many different coaching jobs from Penn State and Lehigh to Stanford and Maryland. You've been able to kind of sample coaching in different areas. How how different is it going from school to school and coast to coast when you're coaching on the D1 level? Yeah, it's 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 uh it's different, you know, and and, and that's where you have to have a, you know, firm philosophical foundation on where you want to do and what you want to where you want to go. Um my, my focus as a as a leader and you know coach is always personal and professional development, right? So taking your your competitive skills, taking your your technical skills to the next level, you know, but giving you a foundation that you're going to not just be this, you know, what you're not just going to be an athlete. You know, you talk here all the time, your identity, it's what you, it's what you do, it's not who you are. And a lot of times we get caught up in like our sport is who we are. And, you know, that's how it is. It's, this is something that you do, but, you know, how can you maximize your potential to be the best member of society possible? So that was my philosophy. So that's something that didn't change no matter where I was. Um, you know, resources and availability and connections and support, those are the things that, that were, you know, varying from place to place. And obviously, Penn State has a huge following, and, you know, Lehigh's great tradition. And when I went to Stanford, Stanford had a national champion, they had a bunch of All-Americans, but Stanford was so successful in so many other sports that, you know, it was it was tough to really get a foothold on, on that level of success. But the people that were supportive of the program were, were you know, were diehard. And um, so, you know, you just had a different, a different flow and a different way of doing things and, you know, had to do a little bit more on your own, you know, within the program and within the, the support versus um, some other places that had a lot more resources from, from the university and from the, from the campus. And same thing when I went to Maryland. I mean, Debbie Yao was such a pioneer in, in the sport of wrestling as an athletic director and what she did to help elevate the sport. And, um, you know, through that time there, it was just like, continue to engage people at a, at a meaningful level. And as I said earlier, I'm a, I'm a relationship guy and it's just really trying to, to connect and, and build on all the potential resources that are out there. And you know, I was pretty fortunate to be able to experience. You know, one thing that's it's really unique about my, especially as a head coach, um, three of the coaches or three of the athletic directors that I ended up working for were uh, Bob Bowlesby, uh, Ted Leland, and Debbie Yao. And, Ted Leland hired me at Stanford. He was the first, you know, my first AD. Then Bob Bowlesby took over when Ted, when Ted uh, went on to his next, his next career. And then, then Debbie hired me at, at Maryland. And I was on the National Student Athlete Advisory Council when I was uh, right out of college. And on that council, I served as vice chair and chair. And the vice chair and chair served on the management council, which, you know, that was a governing body before, you know, they restructured the NTA. But I served on and had a seat on the on that council, and those three athletic directors were on on those councils with me. So I got to meet and interact with some of the you know, top administrators, and, and got to work for some of the top administrators, and just really being able to kind of pull back the curtain on the NCAA structure and and what they're doing and how to be connected. So I I got a lot of leadership and mentorship from from a wide variety of people, and. Um, you know, I was able to leverage that when I became a head coach. And you know, so having a little bit broader perspective on things when, you know, from an athlete to a coach, but also having that administrative sure. side was, uh, was a big bonus. And speaking to coaching, you know, Cal Sanderson is a, is a good friend of mine, a client of mine, and he's such a great guy. He's made me feel like an honorary alumni of Penn State ever since the day he, he transferred there. And you know well, I mean, you guys were on the 2004 Olympic team together, 2000. Uh, three world team together what has your experience been like traveling with him and competing with him and just your, your thoughts on what he's doing at Penn State right now yeah so it's 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 pretty awesome because um you know to know somebody as as a teammate and then to be you know competitors in the coaching realm and you know to be to be fans of of as an alma mater you know for the little place he's coaching at so it's a really unique relationship that I have with Kale and the one thing I was talking about him is he he is who he is always, right? You don't you don't ever have to Correct. worry about Kale trying to, you know, sway a certain way. Just to, I mean, he he is who he is, and and I remember just through our competitive side when we would get together and you know oh three oh four, and he actually made the team in oh two and didn't wrestle because that was a senior in college and he wanted to focus on you know finishing his career and winning his first NBA title. So, uh, but he was in the training camps and things like that. So I you know got to know him in that capacity and. We did a lot of stuff, played video games, played poker, trained, and, and he was always the same. I mean, 
when he was playing video games, he was he was laser focused on trying to be, <laughs> yep. you know, the the dominant guy there. And you know, when playing poker, he was very strategic. And so, you know, he was he was always the same person and kept the same temperament. And never got too too uh, too excited. And never got too down. And um, you know, and and he 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 was sure he told you know, he had some some challenges in his competitive career. And you know, his commitment to the sport never necessarily wavered. But he definitely found some some challenges in there. And and you know, he he kept it to him, you know, to a close to the vest. But you know, some of his teammates were aware of it, and his coaches obviously. But you know, it didn't matter what was going on. He showed up, and he he, he worked hard to put the work in, and then you know, he did his thing. So um, that's the way as an athlete, and then he you know with his coaching, and you know that's what you see. So I think that's where I was um, most impressed with him as a, as an individual that he was able to you know keep that 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 presence, you know, the, you know himself. He just kept his identity. Um, through through everything, and that was that that's what he comes down to. So, you know, and like as a as an athlete, as as a teammate, it was great. You know, then when we were, uh, you know, and I wouldn't say we were competing against them because Penn was definitely on a on a much higher level against the teams that I was competing. But just being in the competitive arena and seeing what you know he was bringing to the table, and then obviously the uh, success that he's he's brought to my alma mater has has been awesome as an alum. You know, as a as a opposing coach, it wasn't so much fun, but as an alum, it was just great to see what, what they were doing. Totally. You know, so you mentioned that you traveled all over the place, and now you're in Maryland heading back to the West Coast to lead the California RTC, where you, you coached at before Stanford. What went into the decision to head back out to California to lead the California RTC, and what are your goals and aspirations with that new position? Yeah, it's, it's you know, again, I, I go back and, you know, everything comes back to, to God's that's plan. So we we took this this last year transition out of college coaching, and um, you know, and I, I felt like that was that was God moving me and saying it's time for me to do something else. And this year transition has been great to reconnect with my family, to reconnect with, with my friends, and you know, just do some things that I couldn't do in the last 20 years of of college coaching. So um, you know, I love coaching. I love I love. The, the, the guys, I love the relationships. I loved everything about that. And, you know, but it was just, I felt, you know, God was telling me that I need to do something else. So this transition year was, was, was really good. And then, um, you know, there were a lot of things I was looking at and trying to figure out which direction to go. And it just, you know, every day just trusting and praying, say, God, you know, continue to lead me, you know, take me on the path that you want me to go. And, and, um, you know, I just, I, I had the faith and, so as things started going up, opportunities started to present themselves. I was doing some, some consulting, I was doing some individual training, you know, stay connected with the national team. So I was still connected to the sport of wrestling. I was still connected to young people and you know, that was that was a real big blessing. And um as the story unfolds, I mean, we had always talked about as a family, my wife and I, of getting back to California at some point. Um you know, we thought it was probably gonna be a little bit later. Um, you know, post high school graduation for our kids. So, but it was always out there. I mean, we loved our time when we were here. So it was, um, you know, something that was kind of a foundation. And then, um, you know, Coach Relly called me a couple of weeks ago, and you know, and we started talking. And and he and it wasn't a, you know, we were just talking about the RTC structure, you know, how it exists in our, um, you know, in in the sport right now. And and I was just hey, just having a conversation and talking with my buddy and about trying to uh you know trying to help him out what his vision was and so we talked a little bit and then after he's like yeah and uh he said i don't know if this is something you'd be interested in but uh if we get this structure going the way that we think it can go you know could i could i give you a call about it and i was kind of like yeah you know yeah i'm like <laughs> i don't i don't close the door and on any opportunity you know i definitely you know want to hear out if, if it goes that way and you know so keep me in mind so and I laugh about it. And I think, you know, I think maybe strategically, I think those guys might have said, hey, we're going to go this way and we're going to try and get Kerry. Or you know, maybe after having a conversation, they said, okay, well, we want to go this way. I don't know how, how he planned it, but for me, it was just like, yeah, just conversation. And and then I told my wife, I said, yeah, you know, I talked to Jason. He mentioned they might do this or something. And, you know, if, if they did it, you know, what I'd be interested in. And I told him, yeah, I'd be interested. And, and she's like, yeah, that'd be, that'd be great, you know. And just thinking that, oh, well, you know, I don't think we would be able to get get back there and you know it would be a tough tough move and tough transition and all that so it's like yeah you know we got to see what happens so through the process and you know i had other opportunities i was looking at but just you know kind of every and again this is god working every every 
thing that we were looking at every 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 turn that was like okay well you know this would need to be in place and this would need to happen and these you know we'd have to see that and, and these things just started revealing that revealing them and I was like yeah this is this is definitely I feel like this is where God is leading me and um, you know so ultimately when the opportunity and they said yeah you know we're ready to uh, to make this move are you in you know we had some conversations you know back and forth but I was kind of like from the start I was like yeah this is something that I think we're gonna going to do and then when things started to fall into place i knew it was it was uh it was a good a good move so you know the vision for the for the organization as a whole is just like i said my my foundation as a coach is always to help complete total development of of positive positive member of society right so it's going to be a 360 degree commitment to helping our athletes reach their full potential and not just on the mats but in you know in, in their lives as well so we're looking at a structure where, you know, it, it's kind of a three-pronged uh, three pronged approach where, you know, we've got competitive excellence. You know, we want guys that are going to be looking to make world and Olympic teams and, and compete at a high level. Uh, but then there's also the, the professional side of giving giving guys, giving athletes the opportunity to to pursue professional things, you know, and, and setting up internship programs and being tied to the companies out in Silicon Valley and, that they can come in and learn skills in whatever area that they're focusing on, um, you know, to put themselves in a position after, after wrestling. And then, um, you know, the third component is giving back, you know, and, and what does that mean? You know, we've all been able to achieve the level that we are because somebody gave back, someone committed, and, and that's what our, our foundation will be there. So it's, it's competitive excellence and success. It's personal, professional growth on a career path and 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 third is giving back to the wrestling community in some capacity so you know we want to make sure that everybody can reach their full potential but it's not a situation where after you know two three four five years of of competing then you just kind of start from scratch it's you know in those years of competition you're going to be building something that's going to have a lasting legacy not only for yourself but for the sport of wrestling and um and that's pretty cool so that's uh, that's what we're focusing on, and it's gonna be exciting to build that build that out. Yeah, for sure, and it's gonna be exciting to to watch what you do out there. And last thing here before that you go, I'm just curious. You've had so many matches. If you had to say one or two of your favorite matches, what do you think they'd be? Yeah. Oh, that's 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 an easy question, and I think uh, people always laugh about it because I say that one of my favorite, one of my most significant, one of my most uh, I don't know, just impactful matches. My my junior year in in high school, like I said, I I um I won the county tournament. I you know I went to the state state finals. But for the county, so the way again back then in New York, only one one wrestler per section went to the state tournament. So you had to win your section to go to the state tournament. And um, the way things worked through the year, coming towards the end of the season, um, the guy that was ranked number one in the state was a, a senior from Hop Hog High School, one of the you know, successful programs on the island. And I was ranked second. I was a junior. So, yeah, the top two guys in the state. And a lot of times what had happened in previous years where the top two guys in the county were the top two guys in the state and say if the number one guy won but something happened, the number two guy would go to the state tournament and end up winning a state yeah. title. So that's how good it was from our from our, our section. So um, so we were one and two in the state, and, and I – you know, I knew I was going to have to wrestle this guy. And, and one of my teammates, who was a, a great mentor, man, Nick Hall, who wrestled at Old Dominion, he was, uh, you know, he's a cadet world champion. He was very successful. And he said, hey, listen, you know, we've got, you know, the kid's name is Jason Dove. He's like, we, you know, we're going to have to, if you go to states, you're going to have to beat Jason Dove. So we started, uh, and, I, you know, I'd never done this to the point where we started scouting. Like, we would go to, to watch him wrestle at, Dove, you know, Nick would drive me, and we go see him, and we go watch him wrestle and start coming up with a game plan and, you know, just – just to know that, hey, we got to be prepared to beat this guy. And it was pretty cool because, you know, Nick and I were, were workout partners and he was the mentor and, you know, he took it upon him to say, hey, let's, let's go. Because he wanted, you know, obviously he wanted me to get to the state tournament and be a state champ. So, um, so we scouted, we watched him a couple times and we had a game plan and, you know, we wrestled and I think uh, it was a 0-0 it was zero, zero match in the first period and then the second period he was down, he got an escape and third period he was, you know, he was pretty tough on top and he was riding and I got a reversal about 30 seconds left in the third period, so I had to, I had to ride him out to win, and I did. So, you know, it was a two-to-one match, and, and I won. So I was county champ, and I was going on stage. But it was just how the uh, the culmination of all the preparation and all the, the focus that it took to, uh, to 
prepare for that match and 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 you know have it come out and actually win. So that was that was something pretty cool that always stands out. And um, yeah, I think about that. That's one of my favorite matches of all. And you know, if you go later on, you know, I can't I can't uh, you know emphasize enough about how you know making that Olympic team in 2000 just uh, you know through that process of series. We, Stephen Neal and I went back and forth in those years and. Yeah, he beat me in 99. He was a world champion. So for me to come back and beat him in 2000 to make that Olympic team. And yeah, the final match was, uh, it was such a good match. And, you know, it was, I felt good. I was, I had a game plan and a strategy and again, executed it. And it was, uh, it was awesome just to make that first Olympic team. So uh, those are two that, I mean, I could, I could pick a handful, but those are two that, that stand out, you know, and the, the third one would be, you know, my NBA title as a sophomore, um, you know, winning that title and, and, um, you know, just starting that that journey to uh, get my picture on the wall and actually realizing it, but then knowing that I was still going to continue to build off of that. So, but those are those are a couple of ones that jumped to my mind that I like to talk about often. Yeah, and I mean, I, I love the story of having the picture on the wall and wanting it on the wall and finally taking it down. So that's super cool. And listen, we've just spent an hour with some stories, and I could probably talk to you for three more hours with more stories. Yeah. So you might have to come back on for a part two. But for now, Kerry, thank you so much for spending some of your early Saturday morning time with me. I yeah. really appreciate it. Yeah, it was my pleasure. I'm glad you worked out, looked out. I'm, I'm glad it worked out. I'm, I apologize for some of the background noise, but... uh it was awesome to get on. I definitely I'd love to get back on it and chop it up some more. Awesome. Listen, have a safe flight, and we will talk soon. All right. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate awesome. it. Awesome. Thank you. And that is it for today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. If you did enjoy this episode of the podcast, be sure to leave a five-star rating review on Apple Podcasts and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on more episodes. For more wrestling content, be sure to follow Bash Mania on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And follow me. I'm at jbash on Instagram and at justinjbash on Twitter. I'll be back with another episode shortly. See ya. And the beat goes on. On.